I want to thank Alden personally for your stories. I'm particularly the one about grade three and moving to grade six. It reminded me, of course, when I was about that age and it was a few more years prior to your time, uh, it was the Lone Ranger and my friend said I no longer could be the Lone Ranger and I, I loved wearing that mask. Um, but they get, did give me the option, they said you could play Tonto, which was interesting, which is interesting. Also, thank you, Alden, because I think what you also provided for us is a, um, a wonderful jumping off spot. Um, in my mind, this conference is about a time for reflection, but it's also a time to be challenged and to some sense to be uncomfortable. And I can recall back uh, when I first started teaching in 1976, and when asked about the future of multiculturalism, and I looked at my, my students in my class, I said to them, to my colleagues, not a problem, not a problem. Because in, in those days in, in Vancouver, uh, the main radio stations were still on the AM dial. It was 730C, uh, C, uh, CKLLG and 1410C fund, for those of you who remember. And I said, you know, those new students coming from all different parts of the world, coming to our classrooms, they'll listen to those radio stations. They'll learn to play hockey. They'll come to my PE class and we'll play um, dodgeball. And multiculturalism will just be a, a passing phase because it will all assimilate as Canadians. And, and I think what you've done for us is, is to say what we might have been thinking back then, and that goes back now a number of years, the world is fluid. It is very dynamic. And I want to thank you very much for, for that. We have this now wonderful opportunity. Uh, we have four people up here at the panel. Um, much thought was given to who, who, who could we call upon to provide a, a variety of perspectives to multiculturalism, not only in the past, the present, but also in the future. It is interesting about that question, where are you from? Because when we uh, first met, uh, we said, well, the question, where are you from, is still very much asked. But how one answers it is very different today. So we're going to actually start with the question, where are you from, uh, as a quick introduction. Uh, I'll start, first of all, by giving you the formal introduction. I'll start to my immediate left, Rita Wong. Uh, Rita is a writer. She's an author of three books of poetry, Sybil Unrest, Forage, Forage sorry, and Monkey Puzzle. Forge won the uh, Canada Reads Poetry Award in 2011. And Rita also received the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop Emerging Writer Award in 1997. Uh, she currently teaches at Emily Carr University of Art and Design in the Faculty of Culture and Community. I should also say we're not, as far as I know, we're not related. <laughs> Next to her is Wade Grant. Wade was first elected to the Musqueam Chief and Council in 2004, and he's currently the Economic Development Coordinator for the Musqueam First Nations. He's also a board member for the Vancouver Police Board, the Aboriginal Tourism BC Board, Laurie Institute Board, co-chair of the Vancouver Dialogues Project, and during the 2010 Winter Olympics and Paralympic Games, Wade was the Assistant General Manager of the Four Host Nations Aboriginal Pavilion. He and his wife, Maureen, his two children, Eli, Isla, 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 after Island. All, all of them live currently on the Musqueam Indian Reserve. Thank you, Wade. Next to Wade, Paula Carr. And you did make it back from Saskatchewan. Hi. Very good. Paula has worked in community sector and with the municipal and provincial departments supporting intercultural leadership for now over, it says 40 years. For 23 years, Paula was the executive director of the Collingwood Neighborhood House, which, which, which of course, many of us know here, the subject of the film, the documentary, Where Strangers Become Neighbors. Recently, Paula was awarded the Alan Thomas Fellowship to explore the developmental process that Renfrew Collingwood Neighborhood House in Vancouver went through to build an intercultural community and workplace. She currently delivers training, coaching, mentoring, 
and presentations in over 50 different learning venues throughout Canada. Thank you, Paula. And finally, to my far left, Mo Dollywall. My understanding, Mo, you joined the uh, Multicultural Advisory Council for the province of BC back in 2009. Currently, he is the council chair for the council. Um, Mo works very much to, the word here is shatter, and I think it's a very appropriate term. He works to shatter the barriers between people and to encourage cross-cultural understanding as a patron of the arts and producer of cultural events. Most notably, Mo is known for the creation of the Van Vancouver Bangra Celebration Society. And for those of you, myself included, who participated and watched that, thank you very much, Mo. Mo received his education in business administration from the University of Fraser Valley and is currently director of the client services for Skyrocket Digital. Thank you, Mo. I'm going to ask each of you now to say something about yourself um, with the introduction of the question, where are you from? And the rationale for that is to give you a sense of their perspective to answer the question, multiculturalism. What, where has it been and where is it going? Read off. Uh, or, I might ask Wade to go first. Okay. You want to start? That's fine. Is that okay That's with you, Wade? That's fine by me. Wade. Where am I from? Well, I'm, physically I'm located in the Musqueam Indian Reserve, but I wanted to start off by saying that uh, Alden had spoke about everybody asking, where are you from? As a First Nations person, that question doesn't get asked because people bunch us all together into one homogenous group. Nobody asks, where is Musqueam? If you go around the city of Vancouver or the Lower Mainland, I'm guessing the majority of people still don't know that the Musqueam First Nation is located in South Vancouver. But I wanted to start off by talking about where I come from, my who I am, who made me who I am today. Multiculturalism is what made me who I am today because I'm not 100% Musqueam. My grandfather emigrated from China in the 1930s. My father, his first name was Hong Man Hing. His name is Howard Grant and he's got a First Nations name, Kaya Palano. My grandmother on my mother's side was the first generation Scottish Norwegian immigrant. If my grandfather and my grandmother and my grandfather and my grandmother on, my, on those sides didn't embrace each other, didn't embrace the cultures back in the day where it wasn't acceptable for a First, Nation, a First Nations man to marry a Caucasian woman. I wouldn't be where I am today, I wouldn't be who I am today. And it has allowed me to grow, to understand the differences that a lot of people have encountered over many, many years. I get to see the rich diversity that cultures across this great land that we call Canada can provide to what we call Canadiana. My father would ensure that not only we would go to the longhouse, which we still do, to practice our cultural beliefs, to practice our cultural history, to speak our, our, our original language, but he'd also ensure that we go visit our Chinese family. I remember specifically that there would always be the Chinese sign for prosperity hanging above our kitchen door. Because you wanted me to know that the strength of who I am as Wade Grant, not as Musqueam person, was from his grandfather on his, in his side and his grandmother as well. And same for my mother. She would make sure that we would go and visit my great-grandfather up in Seashell, my great-grandmother, to allow them to know, why did you come, why would you allow, at that time, your daughter to marry a Musqueam man? Because they wanted to change what was going on at that time in the 40s. So much of where we are comes from, as, as Alden has say, said, colonial pri privilege and class rifts, and it still carries on today. People say, well, why don't First Nations people move on? Forget about the past. Why do we have to pay for what has happened to you? I wasn't around. But the benefits you reap today are based upon those racist policies 
the residential school policy. And I don't want to just focus on the residential school policy because there were many, many other policies that have helped to tear apart First Nations people right across this country. One of the other ones that was so devastating was the banning of the potlatch, was the banning and the making illegal for First Nations people to come together to practice their culture, to practice their traditions. So they had to go underground, they had to hide. So is it any wonder why First Nations people have such a hard time to this day to open up to the rest of Canada, to open their doors, their communities and say, come in. We want you to learn a little about, about who we are and why we, why we do what we do today. So as I move forward, I want to embrace who I am as a Chinese, Scottish, Norwegian, Musqueam person, because I have two children, Eli and Isla, and they are Cree, Chinese, Scottish, Norwegian, <laughs> Musqueam. Transnational. Exactly. And we, call, and we call that being a Canadian. Canada isn't about one prominent culture. People say, why don't you embrace being Canadian? You come from another country. Why don't you come embrace being, from, being a Canadian? Now, being a Canadian means about embracing everybody's culture. And multiculturalism, I think, is a misnomer because we're multiracial, but do we really embrace all cultures? When I go out, I like to learn not just about you. I want to learn about where you come from. Why did you come to Canada? Why did your parents come to Canada? What's your culture? I know you're Chinese, but are you from southern China? Are you from Guangzhou? Are you from Sichuan? And I think that's the important part about where we should move forward. And that's how we will truly understand each other and create this multicultural great nation that we like to promote around the world. So that's a little bit about who I am and why I do what I do and why I'm here today. Thank you, Wade. Thank you. Thank you, Wade. Um, well, I, I want to just think about the word Canada for a second because I'm a poet and I'm interested in language. And the etymology of that word is actually an indigenous, it's an indigenous word. It means village in Huron. So um, I think the idea of re-indigenizing uh, Canada and what we mean by multiculturalism in Canada is really important. So thank you for, for doing that and Alden as well for doing that so well. Um, in terms of where I'm from, and that's a question that at different times I've been very annoyed by, but I, I take it in the spirit that it is given, which is friendly today. And um, I grew up in the traditional territories of the Sutina, Siksika, and uh, Stony First Nations, otherwise known as the Bow River Watershed, otherwise known as Calgary. Um, and I live here now on unceded Coast Salish lands, uh, or Saltwater City. Uh, I've lived here for about 18 years. Um, and the slide that is on the panel there is, is about just acknowledging where we are. And um, I'm going to talk very briefly. Like my family is from southern China, from the Pearl River watershed. Um, and in Vancouver, um, those of us who live there maybe don't always pay attention to what's underneath in that natural history and the land. So I, I live near a creek that has been buried and is now a sewer. And in, in terms of where I'm from, I'm thinking about the land and the water um, as something that we need to recognize more when we're talking about human cultures and that there's been a divide that needs to be um, bridged. So uh, I live near this creek. I can't see it, but I can hear it because it still uh, flows underneath the ground in a sewer. And my neighborhood, is, which is very multicultural and very culturally diverse, and lots of First Nations kids uh, go into the school there too. Um, uh, in Mount Pleasant has been trying to figure out how to acknowledge the history that's there and that's underneath. And we actually, I wanted to thank Larry Grant, your, your uncle, uh, who taught us uh, the term, the Hunkamalam term for um, creek, which is uh, Statlu. And we acknowledge the indigenous peoples and this mural that we did along the street, the whole uh, length between uh, 7th Avenue and 8th Avenue on uh, St. George. So that's where I'm from literally right now, <laughs> uh, this moment. Uh, and the um, project also has a lot of words for water in different languages, because I think increasingly um, it's important to understand the history that we've inherited and also the future. And that's, that's um, I think I'm excited about the talk that we're going to have today for that reason. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Rita.
Paula, is where this are you? working? It's yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Um, thanks. Um, well, Eric actually talked a little bit uh, about uh, where I'm from. I'm, I'm actually very proud to come from the prairies. Uh, I, I come from a very small town called Wilcox and grew up uh, in a population of a uh, hundred different people. Um, sometimes uh, we included dogs just to kind of get that hundred <laughs> in there. Um, and I have to say that um, when I was growing up, just uh, as, I, as I became a young, young girl, I found out that my father actually had changed his name um, before I was born uh, and changed the name of our family because in uh, the early 50s, he was trying to get work as a teacher in Saskatchewan and his last name was Dombowski. And there was still an incredible amount of uh, prejudice and stereotypes uh, that happened after the Second World War. And um, so I actually was born a car, but uh, that isn't my traditional name or where, where, where the culture came in. And you know, as I start to reflect on that, I, I begin to start to think about you know, the times when we couldn't celebrate our cultures, the times when we have to hide them in order for us to be able to have advantages in this world. And um, thankfully, I, I have taken a different path and my, my life has, uh, has evolved in a much different way. And I have to say it has been because of my exposure to diversity and not just ethnic diversity, but the diversity of, of different people, of different ages, of different generations, of different perspectives, of different orientations, of different places that people come from, of different historical experiences. And all of those sorts of people that I've engaged in, in in my relationships have made me into the person I am today. And I am so, so grateful. Um, and I am particularly grateful for my time here in Vancouver and in British Columbia because um, I've had the opportunity to explore um, that diversity in a much more different way. Um, I became the executive director of Collingwood Neighborhood House in 1988. And uh, previous to that, I had always worked in the area of community development. It's been my passion, um, as has social justice. And I've always uh, worked in areas where I've really tried to ensure that marginalized populations were getting equal and uh, access to our wonderful resources in this country. And uh, when I came to the Collingwood Neighborhood House, uh, it, it was a very unique kind of organization because it focused not just on delivering services, which is very traditional for a nonprofit organization. It was really, really focused on community development and actually building bridges and exchanges between people in our community to be able to co-create the kinds of communities we envision. Um, had a phenomenal board that had an incredible vision um, to create a community where everybody was involved. Everybody had an opportunity to be supported when they needed to be supported and everybody had an opportunity to contribute when they needed to contribute. And um, so that is kind of the, the uh, environment that I come from and one that I'm incredibly proud of and one that I also know I continue to evolve in. And as, as Eric had said just recently, I, I had a fellowship where I was able to sit back and reflect with people in our community about our journey over a 25 year period of time on how we actually brought diversity together to co-create a community that we're all very proud of and a workplace that we're proud of as well. And and it's not just about connecting people, but it's also about connecting the kind of different sectors that we all work together. We have private, public, and community and academic sectors that are all very interested in, in moving our societies forward in really positive and respectful ways. But we also could use different, different disciplines to be able to do that and to be able to not just look at bringing diversity of people together and diversity of sectors, but also diversity of, of approaches together, like using the arts with culture, with education, with recreation, with economic development, starting to look at ways that we can actually be really, be really creative because I do believe as we bring those those components together, we actually can have a much greater whole. So that's the person I am today. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Paula. <laughs> Mo. Hi. Um, I'm happy I was able to go last because I had the chance to change my answer a few times. <laughs> um, so I, I think, I mean, to the question of where I'm from, uh, you know, maybe I'll talk about the trajectory of my life a little bit. Um, you know, I'm, I'm born in Canada. I was uh, born in a place not too far from here. Uh, agrarian culture, rich, fertile soil. 
otherwise known as Abbotsford. Um, and I grew up uh, up until the, about the fourth grade in a predominantly white neighborhood, uh, so predominantly white that I was the only, uh, you know, child of color uh, at, at my elementary school. So it was a bit of an interesting upbringing because um, I got to be myself, I got to be Punjabi, um, you know, basically on the evenings and, and on the weekends. Uh, and beyond that, I mean, I, I did very much stand out like a, like a sore thumb in this uh, French immersion elementary school that I was going to. Um, so, you know, for the most part, I kind of thought it was normal to get chased around at recess, but uh, later on I realized it wasn't. Uh, but I, I had a couple of interesting sort of jarring experiences, because that was up until about the fourth grade, but shortly thereafter my parents moved to a different part of Abbotsford. And now suddenly I was in a predominantly Punjabi elementary school. And boy, was that a culture shock. Mm. Um, so again, you know, somebody being used to uh, being Punjabi on the evenings and weekends, uh, suddenly I was the whitewashed one of the bunch. And I was ostracized again and chased around at lunch hours and recesses. <laughs> um, and I mean, as, as life sort of progressed, I mean, I had a couple of really interesting experiences that kind of, um, I think, had an effect on me. Um, you know, just kind of highlighting the importance of events and cultural experiences. I think back to um, Expo 86. And I was a fortunate kid in that I was the first sort of uh, kid born in the family. So amongst all the uncles and aunts, you know, when they were taking their various trips to Expo 86, uh, I was the sort of default kid that they would kind of drag along. So they had these three-day passports for Expo 86. And I remember going four times. Um, so I, I spent 12 days at this exhibition, and I went through so many pavilions, and I was so proud of all the little stamps I got. And I remember back then having so many experiences where I would pick up an artifact, there'd be a pillow or something, uh, you know, there'd be some uh, some sort of textile or clothing or jewelry, and thinking about, you know, where in the world did this come from, from all these different pavilions we visited. Um, and that's something that I think kind of kind of stayed with me for a long time. Um, and then kind of progressing into high school and later life. Um, I had the experience of, uh, you know, seeing the sort of segregation, some of which Alden kind of alluded to in his presentation, of, uh, of the kids that were born here and the kids that weren't, and how, you know, clicky these groups were and how they treated each other. Um, and I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a little ashamed to say, uh, being as ignorant as I was at that age, you know, I was a part of that clique of kids that was born here. I mean, it was nice to be accepted for one, so I was kind of holding on to that pretty dearly. <laughs> Um, but, you know, in the realm of jarring experiences, I think my next one actually came in my move to, uh, to California. Because uh, in California, I was referred to as, as an Indian. Oh, you're Indian. That's great. Indians are smart people. That's wonderful. But I was like, well, you know, I'm, yeah, I guess I'm Indian, but I'm born from, you know, I'm, I'm born in Canada. Um, and it was, it was the first time I, I feel, anyways, that I actually saw diversity. Um, you know, Vancouver's got a specific sort of diversity, but what I felt and saw in California was just this rampant, out of control diversity. Um, so, you know, so much so that, you know, the type of people that I, I worked with and the type of people that I interacted with on a daily basis uh, were just from all over the place, had, you know, such different upbringing, such different experiences in life that had brought them together. And, you know, at the time I was a software developer, so the thing that brought us together was, you know, this notion that we're all working together on these projects to deliver these products uh, at a time when the internet itself was going through a lot of upheaval. Um, so it was an interesting experience to me because, uh, again, just, just the, the type of diversity and, and the breadth of it was amazing to me. I had never um, you know, seen or felt that before. And in that regard, it kind of uh, put my own sort of, um, you know, my own culture sort of in context. Because uh, if, I think before going to California, if you'd asked me to uh, draw a map of sort of where my parents are from in India, I would have kind of assumed that Punjab, you know, covered the entire thing. And then there was <laughs> some South Indian somewhere. Uh, but shortly after coming back from California, I kind of realized what the context was and what a, what a minority Punjabis are even in India. And it was actually as a result of California that I kind of, you know, referring to myself more so as Punjabi, uh, as a Punjabi Canadian than, than anything else. Um, but I mean, coming back to Vancouver is actually where I think any of my sort of cultural activity, activity started. Because uh, again, after living in, out there for a few years, it was a bit of a jarring experience um, coming back to this place and seeing it almost for the first time. Uh, I sometimes refer to culture in Canada as, um, you know, very neatly organized. Uh, it's just a great bento box. 
Um, and I really felt this, you know, in, in Vancouver especially. I thought, you know, I'm not seeing that, that diversity, that mixing, that embracing, that culture of curiosity that I was finding in California. So I want to set out to change that somehow. Um, you know, I, I think it was sort of a pluralism that I saw in California. And here I was seeing kind of a serial string of monocultures that were kind of sitting on this, on this linear plane. And, and that was, you know, one thing that really deeply sort of affected me. Um, and motivated me to, you know, start things like um, the Vancouver International Bangladesh Celebration Society. Um, it wasn't because, you know, I was that, you know, enamored with the music or dance or anything else. More than anything, I really felt that, um, you know, there's so many things that divide people. I often say, you know, race, language, religion, these are all potential barriers. Uh, culture is the only thing I've found in my life that I think is a potential door opener. It's a potential thing that you can use as a connector. Um, so being a software developer uh, and, and really only understanding software, because uh, I, I mean I spent a decade uh, doing that work, uh, I've moved back to Vancouver and suddenly decided that I was going to become some sort of cultural champion to bring about change. And the most interesting part of that experience for me was uh, some of the experiences we had uh, in development of software that actually influenced my cultural work. Because uh, at the time, there was a book I had just finished reading that really influenced me called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. And at the time, there was a lot of tension in the space of software development and the internet that talked about this old school methodology of Microsoft, Sun Microsystems, these closed source cathedrals, if you will, of, of software and knowledge. And about the internet and the open source environment, which was the bazaar, which was constantly being renegotiated, which was constantly ex exchanging information and ideas, and it really had that culture of curiosity. So when I came back and sort of perceived Vancouver for the first time, I really looked at the space and I thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if we kind of tore down these old cathedrals of, re you know, religious, racial, ethnic spaces, and we created a culture that was a bit of a bazaar, that was constantly renegotiating itself and constantly redefining itself. Um, and I think eight years later, that's sort of what brings me to this panel today. Thank you. Thank you, Merle. As you can see, all four of our guests um, come from both similar and yet different perspectives on this issue of multiculturalism. Um, a question to contemplate, um, if we think of multiculturalism as a government policy or as a social idea. Um, wh what are your thoughts in terms of its weaknesses and also its strengths? And, and I, I might start going back to something that Alden mentioned. Uh, he talked about, I think, the mosaic uh, as being an idea that has no longer has cachet. It, it's now uh, out of style. Um, and, and, I, and as I think about that, I could not help but think to myself, it caused me some grief when I heard him say that. Not in, not, not in a negative way, but because I so much embraced it 30, 40 years ago. What are your thoughts about multiculturalism, both as a, uh, a government policy and a social idea? Anyone would like to start? I know that's always difficult. I'll jump in. Um, Mo. So uh, the, the mosaic is something that uh, I mean, again, it kind of goes to the whole cathedral and bazaar idea. I've, I've kind of tried to challenge in my own work. Um, and and I, again, this is, you know, I'm, I'm no specialist in this field, but this is something that I'm kind of learning as I go as well. Uh, but what's interesting to me is that there is this notion that this is a new thing, um, this, this idea of having many cultures living together. Um, and it just seems so prescriptive. Um, you know, a, a model or a policy to kind of live in where when you actually, you know, even look back in history, you know, the, the only part that's been kind of, I think, you know, prescriptive or, or different uh, in comparison to history is this brief period of monoculturalism. All of history is about human migration and plurality, right? It's about cultures constantly moving and adapting and renegotiating themselves. Mm -hmm. And then for a brief period of human history, we have this sudden creation of borders and centralization and this notion that, you know, monocultural is better. And, and it's been brief. And in mm. response to that, you know, we've, we've created this notion of this mosaic of, of you know, these, these different monocultures kind of occupying the same space. Mm. Uh, but in this regard, I mean, I, I'm very much in agreement with Alden in that 
Um, I don't think you know you can prescribe a policy or a model um, that describes it and then walk away from it. Uh, and I think that is probably you know the only uh, failing in this mosaic uh, description. I think it was probably right for the time because I think a lot of the conversation we're having right now, uh, you know, might have been perhaps too evolved for the type of country we were in at, at that point. Uh, but I think you know we definitely need a recognition of the fact that what was right for those times isn't right now, and especially in reference to government policy. Uh, I mean, I, I sit on the chair of a provincial council, uh, so we have you know a lot of interactions with government, and thankfully the minister has left, so I can say this a little bit more boldly. Uh, but uh, government too often has you know a tendency to kind of enact a policy, uh, do this thing, and then retreat to a safety position, saying, "Oh, thank God that's handled." Mm. And governments do it, and people do it sometimes as well. And Alden alluded to some of this. I mean, one of my own coworkers has said to me once, "Oh, I don't see race. I'm colorblind." Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't see it at all. I, you know, everybody's equal to me, and you know that that's just um, you know a, a bit of a facade because mm -hmm. it's it's always an ongoing negotiation. There's always, you know, human beings. Our brains, in fact, even are are you know built this way to create taxonomies. That's how we organize information. And unless you actually you know renegotiate that and you know that this is a failing within mm -hmm. yourself, and to some degree even a failing within government mm -hmm. and these large institutions that enact these policies. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you almost are cursed by, by you know, your own legacy. Mm -hmm. So the mosaic was, I think, good for the 70s and 80s, mm -hmm. uh, but now there really has to be a recognition that, you know, we're not looking for the answer, we're looking for the new mm -hmm. formula that's going to be the ongoing formula. So mosaic has outlived its usefulness? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like disco? No, just joking there. Um, but disco can come back. <laughs> thank <laughs> God. Thank you. Thank you, Mo. Um, Paula. You me to Paula. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think that um, I think multiculturalism uh, as as a concept, a policy, um, as the acts were were very beneficial for Canada. I think uh, it did allow us to recognize that we were a diverse nation and that we had strength in that diversity. And I think that that's a really good foundation to to build upon. But I also um, really believe that it also had a tendency to be able to segregate us and to create still some silos. Uh, I agree with Alden that it, it did not recognize that culture is an evolutionary thing. It's not something that remains static. It's something that is very dynamic and very active and we need policies and approaches that are going to allow us to do that. And I think that that's sometimes one of the difficult things is we start to create ways to be able to encourage um, uh, positive and dynamic relationships between one another is is that we have a tendency to try to standardize and I think that that's that's a very difficult approach when we have such diversity and such dynamism in the environment that it actually squelches our uniqueness and our opportunities to co-create some pretty phenomenal stuff and um, so I think uh, just to kind of wrap up on that question is, is that I do think that it did serve our purpose, but I think we have evolved well beyond that. And I think it would be time for us to start to look at ways that we can embrace that evolution and take it as far as we possibly can. Because I really think that by bringing our diversity together, we can co-create a pretty phenomenal society. Paula. I, th I think I also heard you say something in regards to, do you see multiculturalism as, as, as a form to stifle individualism, stifle creativity? It can. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not necessarily just multiculturalism, but I think it's how we approach okay. the enhancement of, of our work together, right? And I think our tendency is to try to find standardized approaches mm. as opposed to trying to allow um, the diversity of creativity to come mm. forward. And I think that that's a real challenge because we are, we want to compare, we want to ensure that we we can see that we're making progress and what have you, and that that often requires a more standardized approach. But what it does do is it does stifle the creativity on the ground. Now, actually, as you say it, I'm thinking to myself, multiculturalism is, is, is a human, human created definition. Exactly. And so we can def if we can define it one way 30, 40 years ago, we can redefine it again. Wait. Sorry, I was born in 1978, so oh, I remember when the multiculturalism... We had, we had that conversation, <laughs> didn't we? <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I want to touch on what Mo said, that multiculturalism is a, 
isn't a new thing. I mean, um, we have the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil who are three vastly different histories in this, in this community we call Vancouver that have their own histories for over, um, since time immemorial, we always say. And uh, it, it, to me, uh, it seemed like multiculturalism. We want to embrace it. But to a certain extent, we, 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 we'll, we'll allow it for, for in a certain certain way. So, I mean, uh, what I'm trying to say is that um, as long as we don't fall too far away from our two founding nations, the English and the <laughs> French nations, uh, when we forget that uh, there was actually three founding nations, and uh, um, but uh, that's another that's another topic, because I, I find that I always get upset, and when I li and I shouldn't listen to the media, and I shouldn't w go on those uh, those darn comment sections in uh, on the CBC uh, websites. But you know, we always he have the friends that well, you know, I like you said, I, I'm accepting, I'm colorblind, but then you go on the, the CBC news news blogs, you obviously see that multiculturalism hasn't been embraced as much as people like to say. And um, you know, one of the things I always point to is that people seem to say that um, you know they're accepting of cultures, they're accepting of those sorts of things. Um, and then I want to. Uh, last week, I was listening to the radio, and uh, there was a big uproar about uh, a cadet being called the Sikhs. And uh, I was like, what? Why, why is that uproar? That you know, they're embracing who they are, embracing the, the, the culture, they're embracing what they are. Are the and then the people that were calling in. They were saying, well, you know, they shouldn't bring in race, they shouldn't bring in religion. And I'm asking, well, would they call in when my, my father, my uncle go out and say, you should stop using the word Indians, Braves, Redskins, those sorts of things to, for, for, the, uh, for, for, for naming other sports teams and those sorts of things. So it just seems that there's still that the hypocrisy in the, in, the, in the dynamic there that we need to start getting over. So those are the sorts of things that frustrate me and why I'm trying to move forward to redefine what the, the uh, multicultural spectrum is in, in this country. Now, I have to ask you this, Wade, then. Given that, what do your, how, do your, how do your children define themselves? Or how do they, as we use the new, how do they inform themselves? My children, my son is four and my daughter is one. So my, my daughter is not, uh, not defining not herself yet. yet. <laughs> she defines herself by going, ah, 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 <laughs> uh, <laughs> and screaming at dad. But my son knows where he comes from. I mean, that, that's the sort of thing is that we, we ensure that he learns, to, uh, you know, learns that he comes from Musqueam, but also that his grandmother comes from a place called Bearskin Lake, Ontario, which is actually mm. uh, far north of Ontario. But his grandfather was a World War II rear gunner for uh, for the, the Royal Canadian Air Force, and he, he flew in a Lancaster bomber and those sorts of things. So he protected this land for everyone, those sorts of things. So we want to ensure that uh, he, he understands who he is as a whole, not just as a as as one group uh, opposed to another. So that's where that's where he's identifying himself. He knows whenever he sees a plane, he says, "Was my grandpa on that plane?" and those sorts of things. So th that's how we're trying to def define who he is. Thanks, Wade. Great. So I appreciated what you said, Mo, about renegotiating taxonomies, because I think we're definitely in, in the midst of that. Um, and I wanted to go back to your question about the strengths and weaknesses, Eric, because I think some of the weaknesses are that uh, we're looking at a time when federally um, class divides are increasing. I think we can look at um, it's a very worrisome time. There's a rise in terms of temporary workers with no rights. There's a decrease in terms of refugees and um, family reunification. I mean, on the ground, it, it's looking pretty rough right now. Um, and it has been rough for a long time. So I think when we're thinking about class, uh, we really need to think about class in terms of income, in terms of access to um, uh, work and income and education and all of those things. And I think those are very real challenges that continue to exist and have existed systemically. So I think it's important to think about um, the systemic issues. Um, and then also, I think those are some of the weaknesses. Like we can talk about culture and I, I love the creative arts. I mean, I, that's, the, that's where my energy is too. But it's a balancing between the things that need to be, I think where government is good is at being um, predictable, reliable, kind of slow, right? Mm -hmm. um, that, that's, that's its strength. Um, and I think in the communities, things are changing much more rapidly. There's much more mixing, there's evolution, there's, there's an ecology that's very dynamic and very um, alive. So to sort of try to balance those things is challenging. Um, but I think in terms of metaphors, the mosaic, 
I'm not totally over the mosaic. I have a sort of a fondness for it, but it, it does, it has outlived its use in some ways too. And I, I think thinking about natural systems, about ecologies, about something that's constantly shifting, um, about the commons perhaps, uh, the shared commons um, might be some ways for us to go in the future in terms of how we, we do need new language around multiculturalism. Even the word itself is, you know, a little bit, maybe not quite what we need, but at least it's getting us to talk about um, that issue of cultural diversity, which I would argue needs to be pushed further to um, respect uh, biodiversity. Mm -hmm. I like to also ask this particular question around the issue of uh, the concept of multiculturalism, because we have people here from all parts of BC, not just from the Lower Mainland, and, and, and what might exist here uh, may be different in Williams Lake, maybe different in um, Revelstoke or Cranbrook or in Vernon. Um, I'm curious from your experiences, possibly your travels, your work, is, is the concept of multiculturalism um, different in different parts of the province or even different parts of the Canada? For example, Mo, you mentioned that. Would you, would you have felt different if in the Lower Mainland someone referred to you as Indian as opposed to in California? You know, is, is, is locale, does the locale or region have, a, have an impact in terms of how we see multiculturalism? I can... Um... <laughs> Coming from Saskatchewan, um, I, I've been reflecting on this because I think, uh, as as I, I've lived in in BC now for 25 years, um, I have I think taken a, a viewpoint that has become quite organic and natural. And when I start to travel in other parts of the country or even other parts of the world, I am struck by. Um, the different attitudes. I hear a lot more racist attitudes mm. when I'm in Saskatchewan. I see more segregated approaches when I'm in uh, um, Ontario. I have witnessed that in all sorts of different places and I see that in, in BC and uh, in some, some of our rural areas and in some of our urban areas, but I don't see it as pronounced. And so in, in kind of my reflections, I was thinking, you know, it, I mean, it's partly we all have the, the Canadian Multiculturalism Act and we have the, um, the understanding of that, but we each take different ways of playing that understanding out. We have, we have different intentions. We've had certain governments that have had more intention than others to do this development, that we have had people who have had flexibility within the policy to use really dynamic kinds of approaches. And I think that's what gives us the, the kind of variation that we have. It is about the intention that Alden talked about, and it is also about being experimental. That is one area that I, I, I would disagree with Alden because I do think that even though we we have a foundation to build upon. We aren't losing that foundation, but we have to continue to experiment because we still don't have it right. Is some of that difference because in some parts of, the, of, in some parts of Canada, for example, the actual visibility of diversity is less so than, let's say, in the Lower Mainland? Um, I'm not too sure if it's, it could be visibility, but I also think it's intention. And I guess if mm -hmm. you, if you start to think about, you know, immigrants, I mean, it, if, if there's a, if there's visible, um, differences, then people have that in, in the forefront, but we have lots of immigration in mm -hmm. Saskatchewan that, uh, are, are maybe not visible minorities, mm -hmm. right, or majorities. And, um, so I, I think it, it comes down to some fundamental work that governments and communities have done that really make a difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wait. Um, I'm sorry, I, I'm just, I'm muscling. I'm gonna, I'm going to keep focusing on the Aboriginal aspect of, of it. But I, I also sit on the Aboriginal Tourism Board and the, one place outside of Canada that wants to know more about Aboriginal people isn't we don't get we don't get people calling from Toronto or Nova Scotia, Germany. Germany is the place that people people they come. And I was actually talking to our membership clerk, the person that that enrolls people or or makes people part of the membership of Musgrim yesterday, and she goes she's had at least three calls from people from Germany that want to join our Indian band. So that I mean, they they they, they embrace it. They love they love that these cultures are so so old and they have such rich diversity. And I seem to feel that 
when I when I talk to a lot of people or, or read a lot of those, like I said, those comment sections again, when it's aver when it's our own, when it's own people in Canada, it's almost like First Nations are a nuisance. It's like because they 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 they, they feel that we're different citizens because of the Indian Act, because of the Constitution, these sorts of things, and they don't educate themselves about why we are where we are today. We are where we are today is because there was colonialism and people treated First Nations and didn't recognize they had rights and, and different things of that nature and why, why we are still fighting those fights today. So I feel that the lack of education is, is, is what makes uh, the pushback to embrace First Nations and Aboriginal cultures is, uh, is a real big impediment. And, and when you go outside of our country, people want to learn more. So that's why we, why in Muscombe we're trying to open those doors again so people can understand and learn a little bit more. So I think that there is a difference when I, when I, uh, when I look at the, uh, the, the skewed numbers of people who want to come to visit First Nations, they're not Canadians, it's, it's Germans and other people around the world. Interesting, interesting. No. Um, well, I mean, I think the one comment I would make uh, in that regard um, is, I mean, you know, I, again, I don't want to categorize all Germans, but I mean, you might be getting a lot of interest from Germany for, uh, you know, coming and learning more about Aboriginal culture here. Uh, but I mean, Germany's you know a country that has declared multiculturalism a failure. Mm -hmm. uh, the Chancellor made this comment. Mm -hmm. uh, they very much have a lot of issues, you know, within their own country, and how they deal with uh, you know immigrants and, and communities that aren't of a German background. Um, so I mean, the only thing I would caution there is that yes, you know, German people are interested, but I think it might be because it might be because um, Aboriginal culture or Canadian culture, uh, we're, we're a great culture to visit, mm -hmm. uh, but you might not want to live there. <laughs> um, and I mean, in that regard, I mean, I would even talk about, you know, I guess uh, how I've been perceived, um, you know, growing up here. Um, you know, ridiculous terms like, you know, East Indian was was the term for a long time, and you know, even myself, I mean, again, ignorance. You don't really understand what this term means, and the fact that it's positioning, you know, essentially Britain to be the center of the universe. Um, and, and later on, you realize things are different. And then, you know, Indo-Canadian, you know, there's, there's Indo, there's a hyphenation. And then, you know, now I've, I've spent the last six years kind of working in the field of marketing. So, you know, when we're talking to uh, cultural groups in marketing, you know, Punjabis in this region are referred to as South Asian, which is, you know, the most ridiculous term ever because for the tiniest microcosm of a minority of Punjabis in this massive landmass of South Asia, to be referred to as South Asian is just like amazing. Uh, but I don't think any of these terms matter because uh, I'm going to draw this distinction between, you know, California and here again. And again, you know, I'm not by any means promoting an Americanization of anything. Uh, it was just the microcosm of Silicon Valley within which I existed and how diverse that place was, that little, that little aquarium that we were all in. And what I found there was that, you know, whatever your sort of taxonomy or your label was, there was no framing of the other, right? You might be Indian, you happen to be Indian. Right, somebody else happens to be something else. We're all here together working for for something else. Here, whether it was East Indian, Indo Canadian, or South Asian, there's a framing of the other. And in that case, I would even you know, refute the point that it's, I don't think it is just about attitudes. I think where you have more others, um, you have a greater likelihood of you know having uh, conversations about you know inclusion and about diversity uh, and about how to make everybody sort of feel involved in the community. Right. But I think in smaller communities, especially in other parts of British Columbia, um, you know, I, I think there's maybe one of two phenomena that take place. Either you have um, small numbers of immigrants from all over the place, in which case, sure, the mosaic's working great. You know, everybody just moved there. It's a fresh community that's growing. Um, you know, the population of any one group isn't large enough for them to just kind of self-segregate themselves. So therefore, they all kind of come together, they have festivals, and everybody's happy. Um, and in other cases, you have, you know, small towns where you might only have one or two other populations that can be framed as the other, right? But there's always a separation. There's, there's a centrality of whiteness, and then there's the other. And that is the issue, I think, that we deal with in British Columbia a lot. Thank you, Mo. Um, well, I mean, I moved here from Calgary, and I, I won't get into um, the differences in terms of that, but in terms of BC, um, I was just up north in Fort St. John recently for a water conference, uh, Keepers of the Water, and was welcomed very warmly by the Diné um, people up there. And I have to say, when I've been up north, that um, 
in small communities, I've been really, really grateful to be welcomed by um, Indigenous communities in very hospitable and um, thoughtful ways. So I think when we're talking about respect for the other, that um, you know, when we have a common goal or a common interest, in, in my case, it happened to be water and watersheds, that that brings people together to um, to work on something. So. Um, I think the divide between the North and the South is actually one we need to think more about as well and how the South can give back uh, to the North. Mm. Thank you for those uh, comments and insights. Um, I, want, I want to go back to something that Mark said earlier in his comment about um, his experience coming from the UK, um, particularly the notion of the tolerance where he was from, the tolerance for racism and support of racism. And here in Canada, the uh, intolerance towards racism, except though he did mention uh, his experience with Blade Runners and the, uh, the young Aboriginal youth that he worked with. Um, question is this, is, has multicultural been used, and I'll put it this way, has it been used in a way to sort of um, whitewash uh, the issue of racism? I'll start if nobody minds. Oh. Um, I, well, I, I mean, I think the short answer to that um, is, is yes. Uh, and again, these are, you know, multiculturalism, the mosaic, words like tolerance, you know, again, these are steeped in policy that was more relevant and apt for a 70s and 80s Canada. Um, you know, what is tolerance saying? It's, you know, you can sit next to me, but I don't like you, but I'm not going to do anything to you, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and, I mean, multiculturalism, I don't think, has, has necessarily responded to, or the mosaic hasn't responded to, moving beyond the notions of, of tolerance, right? Uh, I, I talk about this culture of, uh, of curiosity and, and, you know, as Alden, uh, as Alden calls them, these uh, cultural navigators, um, you know, what are these people really really able to do, right? With, with this, this Bhangra festival that we invented, you know, what are we trying to create? And what it is is that I think this mosaic needs to be provoked, right? Mm. There's this term we use in, in business of uh, provocative competence. And you have provocative competence when you create a situation that forces people out of their comfort zones so that they can learn on their own and arrive at a better place, right? So, I mean, when we, you know, produce events in downtown Vancouver, and again, you know, this isn't, uh, you know, a big self-promotion of our organization, but, uh, you know, we had this, I had just come back from California, we had this great South Asian community in Surrey that was really gaining a lot of momentum. Uh, you know, the, the, the kids that were born here, these sort of second, second generation immigrants, uh, we're, we're doing well, they're you know, getting educated and this community is growing, but they have no sense of belonging or understanding or connection to Vancouver, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you know, they're half hour, 45 minutes away, but they feel like they, you know, there's no sense of belonging, right? There's no understanding of the history and, and what a role, uh, you know, Punjabi and, and especially Chinese communities have played in the building of this place. So for us to kind of return to the downtown core and actually start our festival there, for us was provocative competence. It was to kind of, mm -hmm. you know, a, highlight this cultural form to a community that didn't necessarily understand the Punjabi community that well, and also to kind of teach the Punjabi community again that they belong everywhere, right? That you don't need to, um, you know, retreat to a, a place of safety. Mm -hmm. So I think this mosaic, the notion of multiculturalism, I, th I think it very much needs to be uh, provoked. And I mean, you mentioned earlier in my introduction, you know, why I use the term shatter. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's pretty specific, right? Because mm -hmm. I, I think sometimes when something's broken, you know, it, you, you need a bit of a scorched earth policy. I don't think you can necessarily nudge it along, oh. right? So I, I, I very much think that um, our, our system of multiculturalism, um, you know, needs to, be, needs to be provoked and needs to be uncomfortable. And, and this is kind of interesting in my role with the Multicultural Advisory Council of the province, and, and Mark's gonna smile a little bit when I say this, but, um, you know, I, I, like, I like pushing the envelope and, and tossing out notions of kind of, you know, wiping away what we had before, because mm -hmm. we talk so much about the what, mosaic, multicultural, uh, multiculturalism as, as a policy. This is describing the what of a community and of a country, right? Mm -hmm. What is the why, right? Why are we doing this? And, and the why is really diversity and inclusion. It's so that every single citizen feels like they belong, they have access, and that they're equal, that mm -hmm. they can live a life, they can grow and prosper, right? Mm -hmm. they, can, they can have a vision for themselves in this place, mm -hmm. right? And it's the why that hasn't been answered. And I think the word multiculturalism doesn't describe the why. Diversity and inclusion, maybe, because it's about activating every single mm -hmm. person in this country. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you, Mo. Thank you. Wait, do you want to say something? Um, 
When you said that, Mo, it brought me back to thinking about uh, why, and uh, people want to feel included. First, First Nations people as, as well want to feel included, and, and uh, Alvin had that slide about First Nations are 30% more likely to watch hockey. Um, and, and I wear my, my Canadian flag on, uh, during the Olympics and those sorts of things, and, and uh, I think that they just, that's the place that a lot of First Nations feel that, that, uh, that they feel included because they don't feel like um, they're, they're, they're comfortable in, in any, other, any other place. We always talk about in our community, and I said that Musqueam is located in the South Vancouver, but it's located behind Pacific Spirit Park and there's Marine Drive, and there's a, this imaginary border that we've always had, and, and uh, it's always you just go up to IGA and Dunbar and get your groceries and come back down to, down to Musqueam, and uh, that, that was always, always the case, because there was, we, uh, we understood that there was an effort that, 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 to reach out to the communities, but there was no real follow through on, on those sorts of things. So I think that, that um, First Nations and, uh, are going, going about it in their own way now to include themselves in the, in the I guess, in the multicultural, aspect of, uh, of Canada where they're reaching out and, and um, inviting people to their communities or, 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 or welcoming, welcoming them to the Dene territory or, or, or uh, bringing them on, uh, on, on tours of, of different places. So I think that, uh, you know, we're, for, us, for, for my community, I think we're tired of waiting. We just wanted to, to, to take it on ourselves so that we can share who we are and learn a little bit, little bit more about other people. Mm. Thank you, Wade. Thank you. Paula, Rita, any other? Um, yeah, just a couple of comments because I, I, I actually, um, uh, just around attitudes and stuff, as I do agree with you that I think that uh, multiculturalism has kind of reinforced our, our attitudes about the other and has, has created that kind of division. And one of the things that when, when I reflected with the people in our community about what, what made the difference is people talked about um, working with others around common interests and be it uh, making our communities safe for our children and families or building parks or being involved in planning processes in our community that, that really made a difference in people's lives is what happened is, is as people started to meet face to face they actually began to start to see um, the capabilities, the uniqueness, the historical experiences that everybody brought to the table. And all of those kinds of attitudes that people had about the other all of a sudden started to dissipate. The, they started to begin to start to see each other as community members, as neighbors, as people who really have an interest in, in improving um, their common place, basically. And so I, I would agree that I think we have to push that into, you know, we have to start focusing on that inter piece. And it's not a comfortable piece because it's not exactly where we naturally go. But one of the things that people talked about in the Collingwood experiences is that when they worked in that interrelationship piece, they grew beyond anything they could have imagined. It was amazing to them and they are different people as a result of it. And um, that's part of, I think, how we co-create our evolution together. Thanks, Paula. Well, growing up in Calgary, I felt the need to uh, defend multiculturalism because mm -hmm. it was a code word for anti-racism work. Ah, <laughs> Sometimes, like, I, I lived at a that's time when you still, but I, I'm not, I don't think it's, um, I'm not here to defend it or to um, hang on to it, but rather to see where it can go to the next level, right? The, the, the provocation that we need for the next um, stages. Um, and I think in terms of its use has been um, to allow for a lot of anti-racism work to happen. And at its worst, I think that it's obscured things um, like uh, Eurocentrism, for instance, uh, and ongoing economic systemic uh, inequalities that still need to be addressed. So I think there are real problems with any term in terms of its ability to stretch as far as needed. Um, but I wanna just take us back to cultural diversity for a second because I think that it's something we all value, but again, that question of to what end is is really the thing that I'm, I'm uh, struggling with still because I think it's, uh, I don't wanna give up on that goal of peaceful coexistence, Alvin. <laughs> I think it's still a good goal. Um, I think we need to redefine it though, in terms of um, we're in a moment when um, 
Well, we, we, we're, we've survived industrialization so far, and industrialization, just a little bit of context, has a lot of short-term benefits and a lot of long-term costs or liabilities. Um, so we have a good lifestyle because of it, but we also have this legacy of global warming, uh, which is caused by human industry that endangers future generations. And I, for, for me, that's the context that I have to keep thinking about in terms of where do I want to go, what do I want to do. So peaceful coexistence um, would, for me, mean social sustainability, but also ecological sustainability. And because we have these taxonomies, we focus on the human, and it's important that we hold the human or our human organizations responsible, but we also need to figure out the relationship between the human and the non-human at some point, and our dependence. It's, it's been said that the economy is a fully subs subsidiarized uh, subsidiary of uh, the environment. And so it's, if our taxonomies don't allow us to address those problems, then it's an issue. And if they can allow for us to have those discussions, then I think there's life in the term yet. Uh, thank you, Rita.